Judy, and we are actually going to be pitching a hold on United Therapeutics in the healthcare sector. Um, so just to start with, United Therapeutics is a biotechnology company that develops pharmaceuticals uh, that treats um, mainly pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, so that's four out of the five current medications treat that disease which affects the blood vessels in the lungs, which eventually leads to right heart failure and death. Uh, 500,000 people, world, 500, people worldwide are affected by it, but because of its rarity and complexity of diagnosis, um, only a small fraction of those affected are actually being treated currently. Um, and it was started in 1996 by Martine Rothblatt, whose daughter suffered from pulmonary arterial hypertension and succumbed uh, to it. Um, and so that just kind of shows that, you know, she, she's the CEO of the company. She's been up there the entire time, as well as um, like Paul Mahone, which is the executive VP, general counsel and corporate secretary. He's been there the whole time too. So they have that strong kind of backbone of their uh, upper management. Um, Um, so we were originally going to uh, pitch a buy, uh, but our further research found that they have a substantial amount of debt that, um, if you look at the first page under the three highlights, the third highlight is their, about their long-term debt payoff. Um, because of that, we decided to hold off and, on buying it, and possibly in a few years it'll be a, a, a better buy. Um, but as far as right now, they, they do have stable revenue, they do have mature growth, um, their operating margin and their uh, enterprise value show that they, you know, had lost a bit in 2017, but their trailing 12 months is showing that they're restabilizing and actually doing better than before, and that is mainly because in 2017, they lost their exclusivity license for their main uh, drug, which is Romulin. Yes. And so because of that, there's going to be generics on the market in uh, this year and more next year. Um, okay. And our next highlight is the stable and minimum risk, as you just said. They have revenue to get each year, but then they also have a lot of payoffs they have to make better deal in the next five years. And they have opportunity for new growth through their organ trans transplantation. And they're looking to, they've started research on building equipment that help with organ transplant and also the transportation of organ transplant. And this industry is estimated to grow at about 50 billion by 2025. And they've recently bought Revivalcore, and it's a company that is focused on using genetically engineered plates to provide human compatible cells. And for the target price, we had 258.85, and the currently selling at 127.04. And we got that the free cash flows from equity and the relative valuation of the company. In the company operations and strategy, they, they get the revenue mainly from the five commercially approved products, and only one of them has been approved outside the U.S., and that is their Remodeling, and they, their worldwide territories include Europe, the U.S., Japan, Europe, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, Taiwan, Venezuela, I, Israel, Argentina, Canada, Chile, China, Brazil, and Switzerland. And currently they have nine drives in the near pipeline town in research and development, which means they estimate that the drive will be ready to be put into the industry between 2018 and 2022. And they have three drives in the medium term pipeline, which are estimated for about 2022 to 2025. And then they have other numerous research going on with the transplant Fibro core company and other drugs in the making. And right below that is the long term debt obligation that they have. So, like the contractual obligations are, the 
the total is about one billion, and the long-term debt obligations are broken down into how much they're going to be paying in the next five years. And they're currently investing in label expansion and new product development for existing products that are expected to increase revenue in the beginning of 2019. They don't pay any dividends, so they rely on stock appreciation for any time. And then for the comparable companies, uh, we we chose Enanta, Legand, Genmab, and Excelixis, um, which are shown under there. And the reason we chose those, they all develop and acquire technology <coughs> for drugs and uh, develop medications for various diseases and different cancers. They all have a relatively comparable market cap. And um, it just kind of shows that United Therapeutics is, is actually doing relatively well compared to our comparables, even though we have, you know, 2017 was not the greatest year for them, which they had been expecting that. And, you know, they um, are trying to compensate for that. And then for the profit and loss highlights, um, the R&D expenses increased due to their new venture in the genetic engineer case, and they're also trying to they're trying to focus on the investing portion of the business to acquire more money and to get more money to supply their research. So their research expenses are increasing. And then ETHR will likely increase their ratio numbers as the medications that are being developed and have been completed and FDA approved. So between five to ten years, they'll start generating more stability in the overall. Okay, so a few questions. First of all, you mentioned they lost their exclusivity on one of their kind of their key five products. Okay, how much of their revenue came from that one product? Yeah, that I one think it was 39%. Oh, yeah, 39%. And did they indicate that they were seeking any new patents or updates to their, or oftentimes you'll see companies update their original patent just a little bit to extend the exclusivity period. Were they seeking to do anything? I think they nature? already did that. This is after. This is the second time it's expiring. Okay. And tell me about pulmonary arterial hypertension. Is this a lifestyle disease? I imagine with the word hypertension in it, it is, but I don't know anything about pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, so tell me. I did not see that as a lifestyle because her daughter was born with it. And um, what I read about it is that when people have it, like these drugs that they have, it's not a cure for it. It's basically to help them exercise to be able to live with it better, per se. But um, it, I, I can't say for sure if it is genetic, but I know that her daughter had it when she was young and it wasn't because of a lifestyle. Voice. So it might be a good thing to look into to understand what conditions this company treats um, to see how many people actually are afflicted with this condition. Um, if it's if it's something that's growing in prevalence or not, whether or not it's a genetic or a lifestyle disease, they, these are all good things to know. Um, did they indicate in like the like management discussion and analysis portion of their 10K if they're actually planning on paying down their debt? Because you talked about how like their debt that's coming due in the next three years um, is roughly equivalent to their free cash flow. But uh, are they planning on rolling over and just taking out new debt? Um, they, they already like extended, they have some back from 2016, and so they're planning to just have it paid off in the next five years. Then borrowing after that. Okay, so they're not planning to borrow. No, no, and the vast majority of their debt right now they took out in 2017 to buy back their shares. So 250 million is a, a, line, a line of credit that they got in 2017 specifically to buy back shares. 
Okay, and what does that indicate to you if they're buying back shares? That their shares are undervalued. They, their management at least thinks so, right? right? And they, I have a feeling that they know that something good is coming, especially with the, the lung transplants, that, or the, the organs that they're going to be trying to 3D print with this other company. Um, that sounds interesting. I'd like to, to understand kind of the market for their, for 3D printed organs, or what, like how close to commercialization is this company that they purchased? I think mean, it's years out. And that's kind of why we wanted to put a hold on it, because it's, it's many years out, and if it fails, you know, this company could go under. <laughs> that would not be good for us. I think I'm not just looking at these numbers concerned by their debt but I'd want to know if they're planning on rolling over their debt, basically taking out new debt um, as these other obligations come due. Um, I'd want to look at uh, like the debt to equity ratio for some of their competitors to see if they're kind of in line. Um, I'd probably want to look at their like interest coverage ratio to see if they're able to make interest payments because they don't see that on here. Um, and I'd look at those things before I'd get concerned about their debt. I actually, I do actually have the interest coverage ratio in our old one. Where, which Where is, is that? Uh, it's, it's, on my, it's on my old one. We updated okay. it this morning and took it off. Um, but for 2016, it was 272.23. 2017, it was 90.54. We were NA for 2018, and the trailing 12 months was 76.14. Okay, and that's times or percent? Um, because if that's times, then I'm not wor worried. If it's percent, then it I'm very worried. Oh, I would have to check on that. I would okay. check on that. Okay. I bet it's times, though, because their revenue is so high and their operating margin is so high, too. Yeah. They'll probably be able to cover it. Yeah, so I'm not overwhelmingly concerned by their balance sheet. Um, how, do you, how did you come up with this valuation? Um, okay, so your relative valuation is quite high because the company you're looking at has a fairly depressed PE ratio, so if you use PE, I can see why that number comes up pretty high. You also have a pretty high free cash flow to equity. What were your assumptions that it went into this? Um, I've seen a couple groups take off the like description and assumptions. That's like number one critical thing that needs to be on there. Don't take that off. Like the growth rate you're estimating, the cost of capital you're estimating, I need to see that. But do you guys have that information off the top of your head? We use the Excel spreadsheet for the FC. Okay. Um, I'd like to see the assumptions that went into it, though. Um, it means your that Excel spreadsheet averages the the growth rate from the last couple of years, uh, like the revenue growth rate, and that's like the big driver. So then you're estimating like a fourteen point eight four percent growth rate, roughly just looking at what you have here. Um, and I want to know if that's a realistic assumption. And if you think they're not going to be taking out more debt, then, this is, then you'd want to use a free cash flow to the firm instead of a free cash flow to equity. Um, although I imagine if you look at their 10K, they might be really interested about that. How did you pick their the comps? Um, we used Bloomberg, and we just mainly we started with the market cap, and uh, then we did like the E ratio. Then, yeah, the market, we use their market cap and the E ratio mainly to see what companies they have kind of like the same. Okay, although none of these have similar PE ratios, um, I'd probably want to know what these companies actually make and see if they're at a close comp. Once again, based more on the substance of the business or the operations of the business than just the financials alone. Um, questions from the class? Um, sorry. Um, I'd be really curious if you guys can extrapolate a little bit more on the pipeline, because you're saying that there are uh, nine drugs in the pipeline for the <coughs> short term. And so since the 39% uh, uh, share of the most, uh, the, the largest um, product that they are selling, uh, is, they have a computer that is really generic, I'd be curious to see what's their long-term future on this. Because if they 
are only in medium term pipeline, it could take up to four years, right? right? So I'd be curious to see which level on the FDA they are, if they are like on human trials or right. okay. something like that. Of the different yeah, uh, because the forecast seems nice. I mean, if they are issuing uh, 250 million worth of outstanding share and they are buying them back, to me, they're pretty confident that something will happen in their cash flow. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is just uh, you're pitching a hold on a target price that is 100% more profit. So. so maybe we should change that, is that what you're saying? No, 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 it's not my analysis, it's just that you're telling me that I have the opportunity of doubling my money in the short term, and you're telling me about the whole. <laughs> okay. That's all. So a comment on that. Um, if you do evaluation and you get this insane about, like target price, um, first, Obviously, you have to make sure the model you're using is right. You have to make sure if you're doing a relative valuation that the comps you've picked are, are good. But if you look at these comps and you say, you know, all of these companies are biotechs, they're very similar to this one, but they still have, like, patent protection for their, like, blockbuster drugs that are going to last them, like, another decade where, like, our, the one we're valuing just lost patent protection for its big drug. Then you, I'd probably not rate weight the relative valuation as sixty percent because what you're saying there is I don't think even though these companies look similar and do similar things there are some key conditions that make them dissimilar so I don't want to make that the number one thing I consider in my valuation. Okay. Other questions from the class? I might have one more, but it's more for Q. Okay. Um, so. Uh, in the highlights here, you see that the R&D um, expenses. So if I remember correctly, R&D expenses for biopharmaceuticals or pharmaceuticals, they can actually add it as an asset that they depreciate over time. Um, and so would it be possible to do like a free cash flow to the firm instead of a free cash flow to the equity, knowing that this is increasing their value? Uh, how would a free cash flow to the firm help you compared to a free cash flow to equity in this instance? Um, well, to the firm, you would take the um, EV, and so by doing so, EV will be different than if you just go on the equity side and the cost of equity. Am I clear? No, because the, you're talking about R&D here, and that's, like, when you're looking at free cash flow to the firm, the big difference is, uh, you're looking at all the free cash flow that's available to both creditors and shareholders, mm -hmm. right? So you're basically, the big difference is like interest payments. Oh, Not the way you're treating R&D. Oh, okay, you're right. Um, but if, if you do a little more research on the 10K and you really think this company is paying down their debt, not taking out new debt, then a free cash flow to the firm would be a better model than free cash flow to equity. I have that too, on our old one, which is uh, the share price was 170.97. Okay. But you guys are pretty solid. I, I, pretty, I like this company. If I find an old forecast, yeah. sounds good. Um, I'll send you guys some notes after class because I think there's a few more things I'd want to see researched and I'd want to probably add it to this. Um, but I wouldn't write this company off quite yet. Um, but I do want a little more research on a few of these, on um, just their, their product pipeline, on the conditions they actually treat, um, on their plans with their debt. Okay? Okay. And maybe some assumptions going into the valuation model. Sure. Okay. Um, do you want us to do the investment risks and the catalyst, or did everybody read those? You know, why don't we table that? Because I'm going to have you probably talk about this again next class. So we'll hold it for next class, okay? Sounds good.